We are the Broadway Green Alliance, thrilled to host these. The BGA is a nonprofit whose mission is to educate, motivate, and inspire the entire theater community and its patrons to adopt environmentally friendlier practices. And that is, as I like to say, what we're all doing here today. Um, so today we are going to be focusing on green gardening with our fabulous host, Mara Davi, who was one of our first hosts uh, as part of the Green Quarantine series and joins us again today back in her beautiful garden in her beautiful home to teach us some skills, skills that I am certainly excited to learn. So uh, without any further ado, Mara, I turn the floor to you. Oh, sorry, and um, I'm gonna ask the questions get put into the chat. I will follow along with them and I will we'll hold them till the end when we're gonna have a lovely time for Q&A and uh, chatting together. Yeah, yeah, and as has happened in past sessions, if you guys have answers for each other, please feel free to answer each other's questions, keep the discussion alive in the chat as I'm blah, blah, blahing away. I'm gonna try to speed through all of this information so that we can talk and answer specific questions at the end. So as Molly said, my name is Mara Davi. I am an actor and also a member of the steering committee for the Broadway Green Alliance. And I have been a vegetable gardener for 10 years now. Um, I was definitely one of those people that said, I do not have a green thumb, I kill every plant. But then 10 years ago, we moved into a basement apartment in Harlem and we were blessed to have this outdoor space. And my husband and I just thought, if we have the space, we have to do something with it, let's figure it out. And what we found is that nature nature knows best and plants want to live so if you think you have a green thumb they don't have a green thumb just um keep trying because because the plants want to live and they're they're going to find a way generally speaking you might have we've had some big disasters we've had some big failures made tons of mistakes but the beautiful thing is even if the squash failed miserably we had a successful tomato harvest so at the at the end of the day we are you know always happy with our progress at the end of the year so um for those of you who have been with us in past sessions you already have you already know that we've gone through talks about ways to be green at home we've talked about carbon tax fee and dividend we've talked about activism in climate change um some of these all of these talks have left us with hope, but I have to be honest, some of them have left me feeling a bit despairing about just what we can do to actually reverse the climate crisis that we're in. And then Nadia, I believe her name was, I'm looking, no, Natalia, Natalia Jacobs a couple weeks ago, um, in I believe the carbon tax and dividend session, she brought up regenerative agriculture. And so I took a deep dive, started reading about regenerative agriculture. And sure enough, it brought me so much hope about what we can do with our soil and in our gardens to be a part of the climate solution. So I'm going to share a bunch of those regenerative practices that I've been reading about and learning about recently. So that as we're gardening indoors, outdoors, containers, raised beds in our native soil, that we can be doing so in a way that is not only providing us with food, but is actually a part of the climate solution. So excited. So here's a list of a bunch of different reasons. Um, and there are many more of why we garden. And I think a lot of us are extra interested in gardening these days because, well, first of all, we have a lot of time on our hands because we're stuck at home. But then even more importantly, <laughs> we're scared to go to the grocery store, scared about food security um, and our future, wanting to save money. There are so many reasons why we're all getting into the garden and wanting to start growing our own food. I know that for me, the main reasons that we started growing food 10 years ago is that we wanted to know, like to really understand where our food came from. We wanted to save money and we wanted to know what kind of nutrients were going into our soil to know that we were being as organic as possible. Um, 
I've always thought of gardening in terms of what can it do for me. But now reading about regenerative agriculture going down this path, I've learned what we can do for the garden. Great news! By Gardening Green, we can be a part of the climate solution. This is from the Rodale Institute white paper on regenerative agriculture, which I will be sending all of you in a follow-up email. Simply put, recent data from trials around the globe show that we could sequester more than 100% of current annual CO2 emissions with a switch to widely available and inexpensive organic, organic management practices, which we term regenerative organic agriculture. I heard someone say today, sustainable just means staying the course and not getting worse, and regenerative is actually moving forward. So back during the world wars, oh, sorry, I'm not there yet. Currently, currently agriculture is unfortunately one of the largest contributors to our greenhouse gases. We see here 56% of non-CO2 emissions, that's the other gases like methane, things like that, and of carbon emissions, 19 to 29% of total greenhouse gas emissions for, right, including carbon for um, when all greenhouse gas emissions are together. So that's not great, right? Like if agriculture can be a part of the climate solution, it is currently a big part of the problem. But this is why, this next slide is how we can be a part of the solution. Biological carbon sequestration. Miss Rebecca will know since she's an educator. I'm sure you all remember from elementary school when we learned about photosynthesis. That's basically what this comes down to is our plants take the CO2 out of the air and they use it to provide food and to grow. But what happens to that extra carbon? Well, in poorly managed soils, the extra carbon just gets respired back out into the air. It, um, it leaches into the water. It erodes away when, it's till when the soil is over tilled, it releases back into the air. But in a healthy carbon sequestration system, the microorganisms in the soil take that carbon and they actually bind the carbon to other soil components to create soil aggregates and they hold that carbon in the soil. So basically the healthier that the microorganisms are within our soil, the more carbon we will be able to sink into the soil. Our largest sink, carbon sink in the world is our oceans, but they're getting Overfill, overflowing with carbon at this point, so they can't hold that much more. So as of now, soil has the largest potential to be a carbon sink and sequester the carbon that is in the air. I love this page because I love all the posters. <laughs> During the World Wars, people grew victory gardens to feed their communities and their troops overseas. So now we are fighting two battles climate change and the coronavirus pandemic, and citizens are growing climate victory gardens. That is what we are going to do by following these 10 steps that I have coming up for how we can sequester carbon into our soil. Not only will we sequester carbon in the soil, removing the carbon from the air, but we will also reduce carbon in the supply chain by using these methods. All right, so here we go, the fun stuff. Step number one, get to know your garden. The more you know about your garden, the better you can manage it efficiently and to greatest effect. I love efficiency. I hate wasting time. So the first thing to do is to just get out there and observe your garden. And right now is the best time to do it because we're all at home and we have so much time. Observe your garden or your growing space, your patio, indoors where do you get great light how many hours do you get that light for for your full sun vegetables you want six to eight hours of light for your partial you want three to six hours of light and then there are a few vegetables and edibles that can grow in even less than that so you want to know what kind of sun you have 
the next thing is to have your soil tested by sending it to your local cooperative extension. I must confess that I have never done this, but after doing this research, I plan to. Um, you'll find out if your soil has toxins and nutrient deficiencies, so you know where you're starting with. I made every mistake you'll see in this picture. Um, when <laughs> The first year that we were planting, I had just come back from a job out of town and it was the end of May and I just needed to get something in the ground because we had this garden, it was our first year, and I just had to go, go, go. So I used miracle Grow, and we planted straight into our urban Harlem dirt, which probably had lead in it. I don't know because I never tested it. And, um, and we ended up planting our tomatoes and eggplants in the shadiest, non-draining corner of the garden. So we did still get a few tomatoes, but the more you can be familiar with your space, the less time will waste making mistakes like that. And um, as you can know your space, decide what kind of garden you think will work best for you. You can plant straight into your soil. You can use containers. You can use raised beds. You can raise the soil on top of your native soil without putting a raised bed technically around it if you don't have the money um, or materials to create a raised bed. And then you can always grow vertically, which helps with space efficiency so you can grow more in less space. Number two, and the lifeblood of regenerative gardening is compost. Compost is what feeds those microorganisms in the soil. It gives them the nutrients that they need to create those soil aggregates that we're talking about which hold the carbon. And also, if you're composting at home, then you are saving on your um, reduced bags of compost from the store. You're not buying chemical fertilizers or organic fertilizers that come in plastic packaging and have to be trucked long distances. So you're saving carbon all along the supply chain by using homemade or local compost. I'm not gonna to talk too much more about compost because in two weeks, there's going to be a whole thing quarantine on that. They are masters of it, so I'll let them elaborate on that. The next way to protect our soil by not tilling what I definitely sure at the beginning of a growing season you have to go in and loosen the soil and make sure that the seeds can grow down into it. Then you actually don't have to till down. You let the earthworms do it for you. It is so great. It's less back breaking work for you and it lets nature do its thing. So I'm just going to read this Wikipedia quote out loud real quick. No dig methods allow nature to carry out cultivation operations. Organic matter at, such as well-rotted manure, compost, leaf mold, spent mushroom compost, old straw, etc. is added directly to the soil surface as mulch at least 5 to 15 centimeters, which is then incorporated by the actions of worms, insects, and microbes. Another no-dig method is sheet mulching, wherein a garden area is covered with wetted paper or cardboard, compost, and topped off with landscape mulch. This photo is one of um, my favorite gardeners, and my husband actually introduced this gardener to me, Charles Dowding. He gardens in England. He has a YouTube channel, and I just love watching him. He puts down cardboard right on top of his grass, and that you know, covers the grass so the grass eventually dies. And then on top of that cardboard, he just lays about four to five inches of compost directly on top of that. What happens is that the earthworms in, in the native soil, they eat through that cardboard and then come and bring the nutrients from the compost pests. So he did a tilled bed alongside a no-dig bed, and he showed the carrots from each. 
so one, he had broken up the soil and done everything you think that the carrots would grow straighter and be more perfect. But actually, in the tilled soil, the carrot top of the soil, the, the carrots did end up growing into the native soil, but they still grew straight down because the earthworms had done such a great job of tilling the native soil themselves. He didn't have to do it. So here's some photos of what we have going on at our house these days. This first one on the left was taken um, in January, I would say. On a sunny day, we laid down more cardboard straight onto the grass to kill the grass and start the sheet mulching. And then we laid out a new, you can see on the right, we laid out a new garden bed on that front section. There in that front garden bed, we put a layer of compost and on top of that, a layer of hay. Now that method is called the Ruth Stout method of gardening. It is a no dig method that involves aged hay. So the hay breaks down throughout the growing season and feeds the plants underneath. And it works particularly well for potatoes. So we have our potatoes in that front bed. They're growing on top of that bottom layer of compost. And as the potatoes sprout up, we're adding more hay on top. So the potatoes will grow and grow and grow and we'll add hay. And they're so easy to harvest because the hay is so loose that you can just pull the potatoes right out. But it is breaking down through the action of those microorganisms, providing nutrients to the potatoes through the growing season. On the back beds that you see in those photos, we've done a method called lasagna gardening, which is where you layer the cardboard and then layers of green and brown on top of each other. And it basically composts in place over the winter um, so that it is a whole composted material on top of the existing native soil by the time you're ready to plant. And then we just added a final layer of aged animal manure on top of that. We will be planting our seeds into that and then we're mulching with hay on top. So these are examples of different ways you can do a no-dig bed. Another example I do not have a picture of is called hugel culture. That is where you can layer logs on top of ground and then you put compost on top of that and mulch on top of that. And this is a very long process where the logs break down over the course of 20 years, but the microorganisms and the fungi and everything in those logs create the most nutritious, slow release soil for, for your plants. So I think in the future, we will probably experiment with a hugel culture pile somewhere on our property. It's especially good if you have like a pile of fallen branches from trees, and we have a lot of that out here, all of these wild, um, windy storms we've been having. We've got some fallen trees, so if we pile those up, put some compost on top, we can plant into that and just kind of experiment and see what happens. All right, number four, ways to protect our soil and grow greener. Refuse to use. This is probably pretty obvious for all of us who love being healthy and natural and growing organically. Refuse to use pesticides, herbicides, synthetic fertilizers. They harm the microorganisms, the precious microorganisms we've been talking about in the soil. They also harm the pollinators. And then when used improperly and the plants can't soak up all of the nutrients, then those nutrients are released into the groundwater and they're released back into the air causing more greenhouse gases. So it's far better to use the compost that we've talked about and some other things that I'll show you in a little bit. Also, neonicotinoids. Um, I spelled that wrong. I'm going to change that. Um, so neonicotinoids, these have been approved by the EPA and I know that the NRDC, I just signed a petition, the NRDC is trying to get the EPA to not approve their use anymore because it has been proven that pollinators are taking the um, pollen from plants treated with neonicotinoids back to their hives and it is killing the bees within the hives. So if you are at Home Depot, this was taken at Home Depot um, in, a, in a starter plant. If you're at Home Depot, keep an eye out, or anywhere where you're buying a starter, keep an eye out for neonicotinoids and, um, and don't buy those plants. 
peat moss. This is a big one. This one is hard for me because peat moss is so readily accessible. It is in every potting soil you will find. And I had no idea for the longest time that this was an issue. But peat bogs actually are like the greatest carbon capturers, carbon sequesterers we have on the planet. They sequester a third of the world's carbon. So when we're harvesting that peat moss for garden use and then the other uses that we harvest it for, we're actually releasing that carbon, we're releasing carbon into the air and we're losing potential earth to sequester carbon. So we need to choose alternatives to peat moss. It's a, it could be a little harder to source, but they're becoming more readily available. We just have to be aware because peat moss is the most obvious option. I have a bag of organ, organic potting soil in my kitchen right now that I thought I was doing everything right. And then I just looked at the bag the other day and it had 75% sphagnum peat moss in it. And I went, no, I knew better than this, but I just forget to look. It says organic and I go, great, that's fine. So it's just something to be aware of um, because we want the planet to keep holding that carbon. And then just when you're building your raised beds, um, there are good woods to use and bad woods to use. Pressure treated wood and then some other woods that you might repurpose like railroad ties, telephone poles, painted wood, rubber tires, cinder blocks, they all have different chemicals that they could leach into your soil. There's a chance with things like railroad ties, um, which have creosote in them, there's a chance that most of that has already leached out. Um, and it's been said that creosote doesn't go into the roots of the plants, but I don't know how creosote affects the microorganisms in the soil. So you know, if you must use railroad ties, you might be okay, but if you haven't started yet, it might be better to choose a different option. Also, black walnut um, has its own substance, juglone, which can stunt plants' growth, so just be careful with the wood you choose when you're building your beds. Here's organic alternatives. I don't think I can really talk through all of them. You guys will get this, um, get this whole book to look through at your leisure, but there's so many organic alternatives for fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. Some that I just wanna point out, I've just recently learned about biochar, which is fascinating to me. It is carbon, um, it is burned, I, I think wood, burned wood or plant matter, but um, what it does, one of the many things it does, it's porous and it holds nutrients in the soil longer. So. I think you know you might normally plants might normally get like four percent retention of nutrients, or your soil might have four percent um, retention. Biochar can build, bring that up to like sixty percent retention. So that's a great, really interesting soil amendment that I just learned about. And then there's just so many natural ways um, to repel pests without using pesticides and herbicides, and they can be super duper fun. Companion planting, I love this one as a deterrent for pests and also as a way to retain nutrients. Um, certain plant pairings help each other by deterring pests, balancing soil nutrients. Um, other plant pa pairings attract pests and stunt one another's growth. So an example of this, I was not paying attention to companion planting guidelines and I grew onions next to peas and my peas never grew more than like a foot tall. So they are enemies. They shouldn't be grown together. Um, this year we're growing carrots and radishes next to each other. The radishes grow first. They kind of show you where your row is in the soil. And then the radishes can be harvested first. You pull the radishes out and then the carrots have space to fill in the gaps. So that's a really cool companion planting. Um, and then I have right here, we planted our three sisters this morning. It'll be the first time I'm trying the three sisters. It's corn, beans, and zucchini. The zucchini is a cover, is a cover crop. It protects the soil um, and protects the beans that have a shallow root system. The beans provide nitrogen for the zucchini and the corn. And then the corn provides a trellis for the beans to climb up. So it's just a really practical and wonderful companion planting. Um, we will be sending you guys a 
full on companion planting chart in our follow up email that is just a very thorough <laughs> companion planting chart to use um, for all companions. And then beneficial insects. It's been fascinating, a fascinating process getting to know the insects in our garden because there's always that like initial you creep out factor. And so then we pull out our handy dandy smartphone and look up what the animal is and it turns out that they're our best friend in the garden. So definitely move past the ew factor with every insect that you see and, um, and see what, what benefits it might have in your garden. And please, on, on, in the chat right now, if you guys have some examples of great um, beneficial insects, please put those down. Um, this, this spider in this photo here was our friendly garden spider last year. We love the spider so much freaked me out at first, but it did no harm. It hung out in the tomatoes for weeks, getting larger and larger and catching bugs. Um, another one, we had tomato hornworms for the first time last year, and ugh, I was so grossed out by them. I thought that they were so ugly and terrifying. Um, come to find out, if you can get over the hurdle of their like 20 day um, time on time as worms, then they turn into sphinx moths and then become pollinators and beneficial in the garden. Um, if you can't wait that long, you can also just pull them off the plant and feed them to the birds. So there's, um, it's good to know, it's good to know our bugs. All right, here are examples of non-toxic raised bed options. Um, we we're very lucky, like I said, with those fallen trees that we were able to use fallen trees in our garden and get the wood for free. And then down here, I've got peat moss alternatives. So coconut coir is great for holding water, possibly even better than peat moss. Um, rice hulls, and then there's a link to different peatless soil recipes. And there are also more um, peatless garden potting soils on the market now so that we can preserve our peat in the bogs themselves. Final point on refusing. By refusing chemicals, not only are you helping your garden, but you're also reducing carbon and toxic emissions throughout the whole supply chain from the production through the transportation to the waste stream at the end. All right, number five, keep the soil covered. We're talking about protecting our microorganisms so that they can do their job and sequester soil in the ground. So we just need to lay a blanket of something healthy on top of the soil so that we don't have erosion and so that the microorganisms on the top aren't exposed, overexposed to the elements. Mulch, there's my son, Arthur. We just mulched our front, um, our new pollinator garden out front the other day and he, loved raking that mulch. Leave behind plant residue from previous plants. So um, instead of doing a full on garden cleanup, ripping things out, putting it in the compost pile, just let it sit right where it died and let it compost on the spot. Um, plant cover crops. Cover crops can help with erosion. Cover crops can add nutrients to the soil such as the crimson clover it's a leg legume that adds nitrogen to the soil peas add nitrogen to the soil um, buckwheat is a beautiful flower and helps with erosion and then my favorite choose to leave certain weeds in place my husband and i have been talking a lot about dandelions recently our mower is broken right now he's probably going to finish fixing it today if the parts come and so our lawn is currently a wildflower meadow and there's so many dandelions and beyond the fact that my son is just loving blowing the seeds off of the dandelions, they, um, we're just noticing all of the po pollinators that are coming to our garden and I don't have that many perennial flowering plants yet. As you can see from that picture, I'm just starting my own pollinator garden this year. So. Fortunately, our lawn is providing wild garlic mustard, dandelions, purple nettle, and we have so many pollinators because we're letting these dandelions grow. They're only there for like three or four weeks, and I think they're beautiful. Not only that, they have a deep tap root, so they actually help 
hold the soil in place better than your standard lawn does with its shallow root system. So um, choosing to leave certain weeds in place can help with soil erosion and, um, and nutrient retention and things like that. Other water saving ideas while we're talking green steps, drip irrigation, rain barrel diverters. Um, we don't have those yet, but that's on our to-do list during quarantine. Using your gray water. If you shower and bathe with um, eco-friendly biodegradable soaps, then you can use, reuse that water a second time out on your lawn and um, in certain parts of the garden. Don't overwater. Plants can die just as easily from overwatering as underwatering. Check the weather so you know when the rain happens and you don't overwater that way. Um, make your own or buy self-watering container planters and then add xeric, which means drought resistant perennials and native plants to your landscape. Native plants are just great because they know your climate's conditions and so they're not going to require more than your particular climate can provide for it. Number six, encourage biodiversity. At this point, we've already talked about a lot of these things. Different plants give and take different things from the soil, such as the peas adding the nitrogen. Um, dandelions, like we talked about, pull calcium up from deeper in the soil with their tap root. Um, if you guys have other examples, please post them in the chat. What different plants bring different nutrients, uh, hold on to different nutrients in the soil. Um, Diverse crops and critters are important for pest management. They confuse pests by, um, you know, planting certain crops together and um, balance it out if all of my examples are leaving my brain. And uh, we already started talking about lawns. Lawns are non-diverse, so if you can convert your lawn, add some other crops, some beautiful perennial ground covers, some ground covers that might flower and add more pollen for your pollinators. I love creeping thyme, creeping jenny, periwinkle. Oh, there's some beautiful ground covers out there. Um, they'll bring more pollinators to the yard and um, be so much easier to maintain than your standard grass. Plant perennials. One of the really cool things about perennials, no, there's so many cool things. First of all, they're easier because you only have to plant them once and then they're there forever. Um, you don't have to till every year, you know, just like once they're planted, it's done. You just take care, spread compost around, um, give them a little love and they'll provide for years to come. But they also sink carbon deeper into the soil because they have deeper root structures so they can sink more carbon into the soil. Also holding on to the soil, decreasing erosion. Um, like I said, you're not tilling every year with perennials, you're leaving it in place so you're minimizing soil disturbance and you're creating lifelong habitats for wildlife and beneficial insects. I want to um, point out this important note down at the bottom. I was reminded of this on, in our local Facebook gardening group this year. Um, don't clean up your garden in the fall. Wait to the spring until after it's 50 degrees outside because so many beneficial insects are, and, and birds, wildlife, are making their homes in the stems and in the fallen leaves and things. And if you want a super, super clean, yard through the winter, you're actually taking away these habitats and the potential for um, potential for all of these pollinators to be born in the next year. So leave it in place. It'll get covered with the snow. No one will see it anyway. And then you can clean it when you're just chomping up a bit to get outside in the spring. This is my mom's favorite page because she likes the pictures of the animals. Add animals. Put chickens, goats, pigs, or rabbits to work. Um, I'm so excited. We're in the process of building our chicken coop. I want chickens in our yard so bad. Their poop is just the best thing for the garden. Um, important to note, most animal manure needs to be aged. Rabbit manure actually does not so it can go straight onto the garden. My aunt has rabbits and uses their manure on her garden and grows the most gorgeous vegetables. 
if you can't have these animals and so many of us can't have this full menagerie, then find a local um, supplier, a neighbor, someone who is willing to share their excess of animal manure to add to your garden. There, um, there's a casting director actually that has chickens and he used to park his car on my block. So one day he <laughs> knocked on my door with this giant bag of chicken poop when I lived in Harlem and that was the best gift. So you never know where you might find a friend or a coworker who, um, who has some poop to share. Nine, rotate your crops. You guys, we've all heard about this, right? It's good so that you're not depleting the soil. It's also great for pest confusion. And if you can rotate a cover crop in there, then you can actually sequester nutrients back into the soil, like we've talked about. And then again, um, it's just protecting the soil, like always having something on the soil. If you're not using it to put a cover crop on there, then you're not having bare soil you're keeping it covered, keeping it protected so that we don't lose any of that carbon sequestration. And number 10, we've made it to the last step with time to spare. Beyond sequestering carbon in the ground, we can reduce our carbon throughout the supply chain and save money at the same time. And this is where all of those great YouTube videos and Pinterest hacks come in so handy, um, especially when it comes to reusing and repurposing things you have. So I'm going to, I have a little show and tell here for you. Um, first of all, you can reuse thing, a container so that they don't go straight in the trash. So here is my, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second because I can't see. Oh yeah. So here's like one of my little to go salad containers and I'm growing anise hyssop in it right now before it goes outside. You've got your egg carton container and the roots are actually growing out the bottom of it. So I'll probably just leave this in the egg carton, plant it straight in the ground, and then the worms will just eat up that um, egg carton as they, as they dig in. Um, saw this great hack the other day, cutting up yogurt containers to make um, strips for plant labeling, because I always forget what my plants are. I'm terrible at plant labeling and my son loves yogurt, and we haven't been able to source it outside of plastic since quarantine happened, so we're using the yogurt containers for plant labelers. Another one of my favorite things, and I know a lot of our BGA friends out there do this, is regrow your kitchen scraps. So right now I've got the top of a carrot in this reused plastic container. Carrot greens are growing out of the top. We had an onion that had like eight sprouts coming out of it the other day. So we peeled the outside layers of the onion, put them on a pizza last night. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six onion starts with a little bit of roots growing out of the end. They're growing in water right now. And when the roots are about an inch long, we're gonna plant those um, in some soil and we're gonna get six onions for the price of one and we ate half of the onion too so that's like a major score um let's see when else did i forget reducing the use of power tools using your hands when you can or using electric over gas tools saving seeds i'm not very good at that that's going to be something that i learn more about this year because then you don't have to buy seeds the next year you're saving money you can share seeds with a friend. I'm finding I want to do more like one-on-one -on -one sharing with people, especially right now when you don't want to go to the store as much. You can at least like, you know, connect with someone on Facebook and then go like drop some seeds off on their front stoop and pick some seeds or pick some starter plants up from them. And that's the, the final suggestion right down there on the bottom. Trade plants and seeds with fellow gardeners. Um, is there anything else? Oh yeah, I made twist tie rope out of my all, so many twist ties from all the vegetables we get from the store. And 
I've put it up to trellis my tomatoes this year. It's sturdy, it's holding strong. It used all the twist ties that I had saved and I didn't think that was possible. So um, that might be a like follow up and see how it goes. But I think, I think it's gonna work really well as a trellis this year. You guys will get all of these resources. I wanna give a shout out to Green America and Rodale Institute because I got a lot of my information from them and also the garden nerd podcast over here is so good happy gardening that is the end of the slideshow and we have 20 minutes left to talk i didn't think that was possible i love that cool thank you mara thank you that's fabulous which is great because we've got a whole bunch of questions in our chat Yay. For discussion. great um, there's been some great conversation, so I am going to start at the top. Um, and forgive me, someone, if I skip something, uh, jump on in. There's a small enough group you can unmute and correct me if I distort your question in some way. Um, so lots of good discussion. And I am going to start with the first question um, from Lindsay. The, uh, I bought full sun plants because my front yard gets a lot of sun, but living in the Southwest, the flowers seem to suffer from the direct heat of the sun. So I moved them into a shadier spot, but I think they're still dying. These are potted plants. Any suggestions? Mm. Okay. I'm not an expert. Like anyone who wants to weigh in, weigh in. Cause I'm just experimenting along with you. Um, so you moved them to a shader. Are you there? You can unmute if you want to. Yeah, Lindsay, jump on in. Um, you move them into a shader spot because my first thought was a shade. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So they were in uh, full sun. Yes, because the, the tag said that they were full sun. Um, I can't remember the names. They're, they're flowers. I can't remember their names. Um, but yeah, they seem to be having, they, I mean, they flowered pretty well and then they seem to be kind of deteriorating. So I moved them into a shadier spot on my porch. Um, which I think may have helped a bit, but it seems like they're still kind of suffering. Do you, are they perennials or are they annuals? They are annuals. Okay. So they, um, that's the hard thing when you buy beautiful annuals at the store is they're in their peak time, um, their peak blooming time. So mm -hmm. there is just a chance that they're done flowering for the year. Um, okay unfortunately. <laughs> I know. Um, so I, I would suggest, um, I would suggest maybe finding, finding some perennial varieties, um, some great daisies like black eyed Susans will, um, flower in July. Um, irises will flower soon. I would, I would look up, I, you know, my mental Rolodex isn't as strong as I would like it to be. So you could look up just kind of like what flowers bloom when mm -hmm. and just go and pick up to start like one little package from the store, um, one little packet of like an iris and a daisy and I'm trying to uh, add mums for October, like just get one of each and kind of plant them near each other. So then you'll have something blooming mid-June, something blooming beginning of July, something blooming end of July, August, you'll get like a pop of color throughout um, whether you choose annuals or perennials, just looking at when they bloom, you can plan your pops of color. Yeah, totally. Uh, and I had a, another question there that's kind of related to it. Um, when my flowers have died, I haven't started composting yet, but I'm planning on watching the video and trying to get more into it. Mm -hmm. um, should I put the, the flowers that have died um, into the compost? Um, I would say yes. Um, and, and definitely if you come back in two weeks, ask them. It depends on how hot your compost gets, um, mm -hmm. whether the, whether the seeds will die or, you know, if your compost doesn't get hot, hot enough, things will regrow in it. Um, I think that's probably the best for small gardening. I think it's probably best to put most of it in the compost to then be used as fertilizer. If you have 
a large plot, then I think it's good to let things just die in place and for the worms to break it down back into the soil. But if you're talking patio gardening or just a few raised beds, then definitely put that in the compost So because you need mass, uh, a mass of organic material in your compost to break down. Cool, thank you. Sure, thanks for great questions. Lindsay, you wanna ask your other question about uh, soil use? Oh, um, well, I remember one of them was about uh, weeding. Is that the one? Ask which I, other I had so many questions. <laughs> Good. Ask another question. <laughs> um, well, I know I had one. Um, so I, I have my front yard um, is basically just a bunch of rocks um, and the weeds kind of grow up in, in the rocks. And I didn't want to use like a, you know, like a weed killer. So I was pulling them by hand, but they grow so, so darn fast that I don't know if I just have to, if there's some kind of eco-friendly way to kind of make them cease and desist or if I just have to really be on it. Yeah, um, great question. I do think digging, if you want those weeds gone, digging is probably the most, definitely the most effective way to get them all the way out. Um, if you don't mind, covering them for a little bit um you know like if you added more rocks or a different kind of mulch so that those weeds don't see the sun then they will probably die and break down in the spot you'll have much oh, yeah. less of them the more you mulch so covering them in place will help so either digging or suffocating um oh. are probably the the best ways i can think of anyone else have suggestions Feel free to unmute. We're in discussion mode now. That method has worked really well, what you suggested for my backyard, which is also uh, rock and cement. Great. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give that a shot. I think that might be the best move. Yeah. And also, like, if you're, you know, if you don't, another thing you could do is just, like, cut the tops off. They're going to grow back. But if you just want, like, a quick fix, you could just, you know, cut the tops, the tops off, then the roots stay in place, hold the soil in place. You know, you're maybe just out there for five or 10 minutes, depending on the amount of space it is. It looks clean. The soil is still being held in place. Um, and, you know, it takes repeated maintenance, but at least you can like get that clean look. Yeah, totally. And oh, and I think I just found that the soil question that you mentioned, um, if, I, if I have my plants in pots, do I need to change the soil out at any point? Because like, do they use up all the nutrients and then I have to replace the soil in the pot? Um, I believe so. I'm actually kind of like trying to figure that out for my own potted plants right now. Um, definitely you can start by just like top dressing with compost. Um, okay. Yeah, if anyone else has suggestions, but yeah, I would start by just like adding nutrients, but uh, um, and then kind of observing. And if you guys have advice, let me know too. Like at this point, my indoor house plants, you can see um, like a white crusty layer on top, which I think is, I think is primarily salt and maybe a little bit of um, like fun fungi as well, like healthy mold, but mold. Um, so I, I mean, I think that's the soil telling me that it that it needs a refresh and um, and probably a repotting at that point. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mara. Cass, I'm going to move on to one of your questions. Um, Hi, is uh, and I'm going to we're going to take it back to the no dig method. Mm -hmm. Cass is asking is the no dig method for late winter, especially the sheep method method. When does that occur? What time um, of year? So, so ideally, if you're starting a no-dig bed, you want to lay the groundwork in, in the fall so that it can break down over winter. And I must say, honestly, that like that's supposed to work for the lasagna garden method where you do all those layers and it breaks down from fall through the winter and is ready for planting in the spring. And mine has not gotten hot enough or broken down enough in one winter to be ready, which is why I top it off with aged compost and it does seem to do really well. 
in that the worms come up through the ground, through the layers of unfinished lasagna to the compost on top and, and the soil is rich with nutrients. And then by the end of the summer, our bed is completely broken down and all looks like compost. So that's pretty magical. I think in an ideal world, it would have broken down beforehand. Um, so if you, you know, wanna start now, building the layers of a raised lasagna garden bed definitely by next spring you will have composted you know compost in place and it's totally free because it's just your kitchen veggie scraps your amazon boxes with all the tape removed your coffee grounds your grass clippings so if you have the time to devote to it the lasagna gardening is a great way to do that if you have four inches or five inches of aged compost and wanna do what Charles Dowding does in that picture that I showed, you can start that now and plant in it right away, which is great. So you could just lay down cardboard to kind of block out, block out the grass, let the grass break down underneath that cardboard, put four inches of aged compost and just plant, ready to go. I guess I was also curious because you mentioned a blanket um, and I wasn't sure if this was like a after your harvest is over you cover it all in cardboard protect the soil and like begin that process if that if that's kind of what it is or if the blanket is an addition or what exactly that was about. I don't remember how I use the term blanket but it, <laughs> it wasn't I did not mean it literally. Right. I don't, yeah. So you're bit, you're, when you're laying down the cardboard, it is to kill the grass underneath so that the grass goes back in. It is like the weed cover. And then you build your garden on top of that, if that makes sense. So after the harvest, you don't put the cardboard down, or you can. Correct. Um, so, if you, so you're talking about like if you already have your bed established and in place. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so at that, once... The laying the cardboard down is just to like get it started. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, and then you can still incorporate cardboard into your compost sure. um, to break down as one of your brown materials. But once you have your garden bed established and started, then for wintering, add, um, add a mulch, mm -hmm. add hay, add, put some, you should, it, it's good to protect your soil with mulch or a cover crop to keep it protected and holding nutrients through the winter, um, keep those microorganisms protected, but it's not a blanket of cardboard. Great, so that leads to my second question, which was where do you get your hay? Um, but also, do you order, because I had a worm farm for a second when I had no place to compost, um, and that went pretty well until they died. It got, it got too hot and they cooked and it was very sad, mm. but do you order worms or do you just like kind of I mean you've got kind of you've got a nice yard so I imagine there are worms there but did you think about it <laughs> I, I thought about it I looked into it we have not had to do that either in Harlem or here if you have dirt the worms are there um and they found like because we were composting in a tumbler and we maybe added like one handful of soil when we first started our compost in the tumbler and it is filled with worms so they reproduced they found their way in we have never I, i'm really interested in vermicomposting because worm castings are so healthy in the garden um we haven't done that yet but trust start by trusting that if you're planting near soil the worms will find a way or if you're adding non-sterile, um, non-sterile comp, non-sterilized compost, non-sterilized aged manure, the worms are going to be in it. Like we went to a local farm to get horse manure this year, and um, our son just had a blast digging in it because it was just like thousands of red worms right there. So you like add just a little bit of manure and you are good to go. Um, Erin, you wanna talk about where we got our hay? Erin uh, actually put it in the chat. So oh, yeah. the information is right there for anyone. Thank you, Erin. Oh, great. Um, so there, people can grab that. It's I'm hard to get hay in the city, but it's, 
it's possible. Uh, I'm going to just jump to another urban um, gardening question because I know we have a lot of urban yeah. gardeners yeah. here. Um, and uh, in your opinion, what are the best vegetables for city balconies, especially in terms of space and ease for small spaces? Mm. Um, well, it depends on if you have sun or not. Who asked this and do you want to? Sorry, uh, Marianne. If Marianne, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I do have a lot of sun. It's not bad, but it's a tiny balcony. It's safe. Yeah. yeah um, I, did I see someone mention cucumelons? I've never grown cucumelons, but I'm really interested in them. They're like tiny cucumbers that look like watermelons. Um, so I want you to try those and report back to me. Okay. There, there are a lot of cultivars for uh, probably every vegetable that have like patio in the title. So if you're looking in a seed catalog or looking at a bunch of um, starters, started plants that you're going to transplant into your pots, look for ones that say, that have patio somewhere mm -hmm. in the name, because then you can grow a small version of a tomato plant, a small version of a pepper plant, and have what you most desire. Um, when it comes to tomatoes, there are indeterminate tomatoes, which will grow for like, they'll vine like six feet tall. There are determinate tomatoes that are more of a bush variety. Same for beans. There are bush beans and pole beans. So um, growing on your, on your balcony, you'll probably want the bush varieties unless you can use the balcony as some sort of trellising system, in which case maybe you can, what are those? Are those your beans? I think that's a bush. A bush. Bean. I have another one that's bigger. I'm, I'm not sure. My mom gave me some seeds. I, I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. Look great. That's we'll put them out. I, it's hard to tell. They kind of look viney to me, in which, case, in which case they might um, climb all along your balcony, which would be very pretty. Okay. I'll try that, whatever that is. <laughs> Fun. Okay. I didn't know if that patio plant was a thing. I'll look for that. Thank you. Yeah, and Rebecca says um, lettuces are great to grow in small spaces. Yeah, that's great. Um, Jacob is asking for urban gardening. What are your thoughts on LED lights in terms of supplementing? Um, oh, for like for growing inside, Jacob. Jacob, you want to unmute and clarify yes, that? Yes, growing inside. I, um, we have a little bit of light, but um, our, most of our windows are, uh, they have radiators right underneath. And so in the winter, it's kind of hard to put anything right there because it just gets killed by the heat. We we love our grow lights in our house. I, we bought like a plant growth starting kit that has like a little stand that hangs a grow light and then one long oh. I don't I think that one is a CFL um because it's like 10 years old um and it's worked great for starting seeds and and since we've been expanding our yard this year and because I started my plants way too early and they're not ready to go on the ground yet and we've expanded I ended up using my ring light, since I'm not auditioning for anything right now, I've been using <laughs> our ring light, which is LED, and it's worked great as supplemental light. As far as I understand, cold light is good for green growth, and then when plants want to flower, warmer light is better. So LEDs, these LEDs that can change um, temperature, like like the ring light does, it has a knob and changes from cold to warm, actually I think would be very useful for indoor growing because then you can give it the color it needs for where it is in its process. So I, I'm a fan. I, I'm i not an expert on it, but it's worked for us so far. Cool, thank you. That's, great. That's fabulous, I agree, Susan. We should definitely let actors know that ring lights work well as grow lights. That is a perfect, Intersection. <laughs> Intersection of theater and green. Theater and green. I love that. I mean, we but, got our ring light literally the day we went into quarantine. It was like, oh, 
this is very useful now that there's no work or potential yeah. for work. Perfect. All right, we are at two o'clock. I am aware of the time and have to end us promptly by trade. Um, so I will I will say thank you to Mara. Um, if you're okay, Mara, we can stick around for a couple minutes if anyone has final questions. Absolutely. Um, you know, ask an expert, we'll hang around for a few minutes, but otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us again today. This was a fabulous session. I am ready to get out and garden, as I'm sure many of you are, and put these skills to good use and, um, and grow our victory gardens. So thank you for lending your expertise. Thank you all of you for your time. We'll see you next week. Um, join us for our session next week where we will be doing a case study for with scenery bags with Jennifer Kahn and how we can use our creative skills to upcycle production uh, materials in creative and new ways. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Take care. Thank you guys Have so fun. much for being here. Really appreciate it. Happy growing. <laughs> <laughs>